every part of this landscape has been here since the dreaming. So when Uncle Richard did his Welcome Today language, this country knows that. And these birds, they know that. We're all linked through Earth. We're part of them. The significance of these birds is as part of that and as part of us. It's a wonderfully beautiful bird. Dark head, um, black and gold plumage. The way that it moves around the landscape, it doesn't follow a pattern, it doesn't have its own one territory. They're, they're very mobile and adaptive and they're just an awesome little bird. The Regent honey eater is critically endangered across its distribution. We suspect there's somewhere between 250 to 350 birds left out there across an enormous area. You don't get more threatened before a species disappears than what we find with the Regent honey eater at the moment. And once the population gets so small, that in itself causes further population declines. We've lost somewhere between 80 to 85 per cent of what we call temperate woodlands, the, the nice dry open forest that used to occur on the flats. And of the 15 to 20 per cent uh, that's left, a lot of that is really highly fragmented. Their favourite food is gum tree blossom, but not just any gum tree blossom. They need the, the trees that produce the really high nectar yields. They're just such a hard species to monitor. So they occur from Queensland to Victoria. So imagine trying to survey, looking for a needle in a haystack in that large area. We know that to keep this species around for the future generation, we need to improve nesting success. Some of those actions include population monitoring, tree plantings, noisy minor control. We work with a lot of landholders to get covenants on properties. We also do population supplementations. Taronga have got an amazing captive breeding program up and running for this species. We first became involved by collecting some birds in the wild just to see if we could keep them alive and create an insurance population in case the devastating possibility that they all became extinct in the wild. We've designed this uh, methodology where we use these tents, we bring them from captivity we keep them out here for a number of days and they get acclimatised to the sounds, to the temperature, to the other birds that are in the environment and we feed them the normal feed that we would feed them at the zoo plus we feed them the feed that they would get from the forest and then after a few days we just quietly open up the tents and we let them go. So each bird that we release is individually identified using a coloured banding system and they also have a stainless steel band. If that band ever turns up, um, it even has a post office box where you can send it off and the information can come back to us about you know, what's potentially happened to that bird. Some of the birds are also fitted with little transmitters because we can monitor them for the next few months and make sure that, that um, they're staying healthy, they're staying alive. One of the most important things that we don't know is where the birds go when they leave where they are now. And it's really important to know that so that we can try and save the habitat on their route to where they need to get to. Since that first release in 2008, we've done many more releases and we've released just a little over 300 birds that were born in captivity back out into the wild. This isn't just about letting birds go. This is, this is part of a journey to, to recognise and acknowledge that these these forests are, are remarkable from a cultural perspective and a biodiversity perspective. We need our citizen scientists to try and help us locate Regent honey it is. So we are always encouraging the public if they could report the birds to us. I'd love for my daughter Harriet to be able to see a Regent honey eater in the wild when she grows up. That would really show that we've done something here.